Okay. This is a lecture for my fifth hour U.S. history class. Um, and so, when we left off yesterday, we had talked about the Battle of the Washita, which was the largest battle in the Indian Wars fought in Indian Territory, and one of the most famous battles of all the Indian Wars fought right here in Oklahoma. Uh, the Battle of the Washita was such a success. They said Custer did everything right. He caught the enemy by surprise, and he crushed him in a matter of minutes. It's not quite the whole story, but that was the takeaway that the Army had from this battle. And they essentially said to their commanders, uh, this is the way every battle in the Indian Wars ought to be fought. But there were other battles that don't get as much attention, and I think they tell us a lot more about the Indian Wars. quite frankly, uh, than the uh, Battle of the Washita. There was quite a bit of bloodshed at the Washita, but uh, that's not how most battles in the Indian Wars went, so I want to give you a true picture of this before we go on and fight the largest battle of the Indian Wars, which is the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Uh, and there was quite a bit of bloodshed at that, too. But uh, most battles went like adobe walls. Uh, 28 buffalo hunters shooting it out with 700 Comanche led by uh, Quanta Parker, and we did the adobe walls yesterday, didn't we? Didn't we? And these 28 buffalo hunters were confined in a little space not much bigger than this room. They were surrounded by, and, and buffalo hunters could shoot, and they were surrounded by 700 Comanche Indians, and Comanche warriors could shoot, and all they had to do was concentrate on this little space, and when it was all over, there were 13 Comanche killed and no buffalo hunters. That's when I say this was a long, boring war, and even during most of the battles, there weren't very many people killed. Now, that's an example. Another example is the Battle of Beecher's Island. It's one of my favorite battles in the Indian Wars because it has one of my favorite people from the Indian Wars in this battle. <coughs> but look right here. This battle took place up in, uh, in uh, northern uh, Colorado. Right there is the Republican River. You see the Republican River flowing through there, comes out of Kansas, flows up there. And uh, this, uh, this man was, uh, uh, there's Quanta Parker. This man um, was uh, leading about 68 men, get this down, about 68 cavalrymen across the plains of uh, Kansas and Nebraska and, uh, and Colorado. And he was crossing the Republican River with 68 men. You know, if you're ever a military commander and you're trying to decide when to attack the enemy, if you can catch them crossing a river, that's when most, that's where most armies are most vulnerable. That's where you want to hit them. And Forsyth here, I'll just describe him throughout this and let you see if you think he would, he would be tough enough to make a good high school linebacker. <laughs> Forsyth uh, was riding out far ahead of his men. He's got 68 men crossing this river, and he's far ahead of them. Uh, when he was attacked by uh, 800 Cheyenne, now remember, he's got 68 men crossing this river, and 800 Cheyenne, write this man down, and, and you need to know these leaders, these Native American leaders and their tribes by test day. Uh, I'm not just calling out leaders and, tri and, and, and nations that they lead for my health up here. So anyway, they, uh, they, uh, Roman Nose was, was, was a Cheyenne, and he attacked this unit crossing this river. Well, of course, <coughs> for, Forsyth, hmm, all right. Forsyth was um, out ahead of his men. And he's riding a horse, sitting in this position like this. And when the Comanche, oh, well, excuse me, the Cheyenne fired him, he's hit three times in the opening salvo of the battle. One bullet came right across the side of his head, just not far above his ear. If his head had been caught this far over, uh, it would have blown his head off. But as it happened, it just creased along the side, cutting his scalp all the way, and his skin, this flap of skin, fell over his ear, exposing his skull. That was the first shot. The second shot hit him in the thigh, hit him over here in the left thigh and burrowed its way in. And he's, like I say, he's on a horse. And the third shot blew his knee out. One of the functions of your knee 
is it holds this bone in. It's been a long time since I was in biology. What's the name of that bone? I just call it the shin bone, but you know what I'm talking about. Does anybody know what the name of that is? Okay, well, anyway, I can't remember either, but one time I knew. But anyway, it blew that knee out, and that if your knee wasn't there holding that, that shin bone would just rise right up. And that's what it did. It stuck out about that far. So he's hit in the head, he's hit in the thigh, and he's hit in the kneecap, the, the kneecap in his right leg, but he managed to stay in the saddle, <coughs> and he swung his horse around, <coughs> looking for a place where these men could dig in and protect themselves and try and fight off these Cheyennes. And he looked out in the middle of the Republican River, get this down, and there was an island out there called Beecher's Island. And he ordered his men to fall back to Beecher's Island and shoot their horses. And there's an artist drawing what happened. They shot their horses, and on come the 800 Cheyenne. Meanwhile, you know, he's back there behind his dead horse, and he calls the company sergeant up there to examine his wounds. And, you know, the company sergeant lifts that scalp back up and puts a bandage around his head. I think you can see that in the drawing there. The bandage, oh, this, by the way, that eventually grew back. He had a couple little ball spots there, but it eventually grew back. Uh, and then he checked the knee. There wasn't nothing. He could, he could, there was not anything he could do. That bone was sticking out about that far. And then he starts kind of probing around for that bullet in there in his thigh. And he thinks he's found the bullet, but he tells uh, Colonel Forsyth, he said, I can't remove that. I'm not a skilled enough. And plus, you're out in the middle of the prairie. You're getting shot at. The guy's propped up against a dead horse. You know, I'm just not skilled enough to do that. I can't take that out. He said, it's too close. What's those two arteries that run right down your legs? Well, you need to take a human anatomy course. The femoral artery, yeah. And if something, nick, that's the main artery. It runs, supplies blood to the bottom of half of your body. And if something nicks that, uh, it's just like if I took what was left, I opened this and just turned the bottle over and it would take your blood uh, about as long to drain out of you as that water would out of that bottle. If something happens to your femoral artery, unless you can get sophisticated, immediate medical attention, you're probably as dead as Julius Caesar. So he said, I don't want to poke around in there and nick that artery and kill you. So there's nothing I can do. And Forsyth heard this doctor's diagnosis and he called the corporal over there and he said, I want you to crawl over this dead horse and pull my saddlebag out from under that dead horse and I want you to find my razor. And you know that in those days men shaved with a you know, straight razor. You've seen it in the movies. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I tried to shave with a straight razor one time just for us. So I'll just try and see how that goes. Because my dad, is, I've seen him shave with a straight razor. Yeah, thank you. And uh, he could just take one of those things and hit it a couple of licks on a razor shot. And just <laughs> so I tried that. And by the time I was through, it looked like, like I'd sacrificed a chicken in the sink. Uh, I never did that. I never tried that again. You know, I just stick with my little big razors. But uh, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. And so he the corporal handed him the razor and he cut a slit in his pants and he dug that bullet out by himself with that straight razor under fire from 800 Cheyenne warriors. And then he bound that up. By the way, his knee here, well, we'll get to his knee in just a minute, but there's the shin bone sticking out. And so they mounted the fence. And they hold that island to get this down. I'm trying to show you the flavor of the Indian Wars. They hold that island from September the 16th until September the 25th. Nine days they're surrounded. Can Cheyenne warriors shoot? Yes. Can soldiers shoot? Well, probably, but not as good as the Cheyenne. So in all of this fighting for nine days, the Native Americans charge again and again. In fact, on the last day, Chief Roman knows himself that I'm going to lead this attack, and that's what this is. There he is, and a soldier shot him right between the eyes and killed him. So Roman knows is killed on the last day of the battle. But after nine days of fighting, nine days of fighting, almost 900 men shooting at each other in this little confined island, how many Native Americans do you think were killed? Let me, before you answer, how many, if this was made into a movie, how many Native Americans would be killed? Oh, hundreds. And how many soldiers were killed? 
would be killed. Most of them, if not all of them. But how many were actually killed in this real battle? How many Native Americans do you think died? Three. Huh? Three. Three Indians died? Um, nine Indians died. How many soldiers? How many soldiers died? Twelve. Twelve. Not many. less. Uh, nine days of fighting and less than uh, twenty men. Both sides died. That's what I mean by this. Not very many people were killed in this battle. They were killed in this war. Uh, and in fact, uh, when they arrive, when reinforcements arrive and rescue them nine days later, uh, he's still propped up there. Uh, with that shin bone sticking out and the flies have already landed on it and laid eggs and there are maggots working on that wound. And by the way, that's probably what saved it an amputation. They ate the infected part of the wound out. So he's got those little mm -hmm. white. And he was reading a copy. He was leaning against the saddle. He was reading a copy of uh, the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, about the ancient uh, Greeks, okay, when they rescued him. For the rest of his life, his... Right leg was about that much shorter than his left, but he, you know, had a noticeable limp, but he stayed in the Army until he retired. He did all sorts of spectacular things. One time he rode 40 miles to carry a message in a snowstorm in Colorado, and it was 20 or 30 degrees below zero. And when he got to the fort where he was going to deliver the message, he was actually frozen to his saddle. He couldn't dismount, okay? So you reckon he's tough enough to play linebacker? I reckon he is. He wouldn't miss school in the morning because he had a paper cut. So anyway, the Battle of Beecher's Island. Well, let's go to 1873. Get this down. By 1873, two things happened that relate to the Indian Wars. A lot of things happened, but two things happened that relate to the Indian Wars. Number one, the Native Americans were on the run everywhere. The Army was closing in on them. In fact, they had gathered thousands of them. Get this down. They had gathered uh, at one to, in one last great encampment right up here. Look at this real quick. Right up here in southeastern Montana uh, in the Little Bighorn River Valley. Write that down. There are Little Bighorn Mountains, and there's a Little Bighorn River Valley in those mountains. The Little Bighorn River Valley. Okay. And eventually there may be as many as 10,000 Native Americans there <coughs> of several tribes, but mainly the Sioux and the Cheyenne, but mainly the Sioux. And they've gathered up there. At the same time, get this down, back in the east. Let's go back to the east. The economy crashed. Write that down. When I say the economy crashed, Banks closed, businesses collapsed, thousands of Americans lost their jobs. If you had a job, if you had a job, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tristan is your name? Amen. Okay, Mr. A. Mr. Tristan. Sounds like a stage play, but anyway, Mr. Tristan, Mr. Amen. If you had a family and a job and you lost your job, uh, you know, uh, what's the first thing you would do to make sure you could feed your family while you were looking for another job? Well, what would you do, Mr. Dyson? I guess I'm going to start calling nobody. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Rogers, Mr. What's the first thing you would do? You go looking for cheap food. Looking for cheap food, okay. Where might you get that? Would you put your feet down? Thank you. You're not in the lounge. Uh, what's the what's the first where would you get that cheap food? You reckon you get free food anywhere? A farm. Huh? The farm. Go to a farm, huh? And they give out they're handing out free food? No, you still go hunting. Huh? Go hunting. Go hunting. <laughs> Eat a lot of squirrels. Is there any easier way? I mean, how long? How, think about the amount of food your family consumes in a week. I mean, it's fine to go shoot a turkey or something once in a while. We'll all eat turkey one week. But just think about how much hunting and you'd have to do to support your family. So where where would you? How would you eat? Still, still, huh? Still, 
Steal, rob 7-Eleven, <laughs> eat, eat little Debbie Donuts for six months, die of diabetes. Well, we survived the depression, but we're all blind, and we've all lost one leg. You know, gee, that's a, that's a hard thing. What did you say? You can sell your stuff. Sell your stuff, you know, yeah. Live out under a bridge. Is there any easier way? Beg. Huh? Beg. Beg. There we go. What about food stamps? Oh, yeah. What about just all that stuff you said? Wouldn't it just be a lot easier to go down and fill out a little form and sign it? And they would say, well, here's enough, here are enough food stamps to feed your family until you get a job. Who provides those food stamps? Government. The government. Yeah, we've got programs like that. They tax me to pay for those programs. If you work, they tax you. I'm happy to pay those taxes because I may need food stamps next week. Food stamps. How would you pay your rent? They have mortgages, mortgage, mortgage assistance. The government provides that so you don't... Have to be through, but none of that existed in 1873. If you lost your job, you were on your own. And there were people in this country, get this down, and it's called a panic. In those days, they called the depression a panic, and this is called the panic of 73. And the panic of 73 is the worst depression that we had in this country up until what? The Great Depression. And remember. You always, when you write the Great Depression, you capitalize that. You never write the Great Depression like this. It's like writing World War I or the Civil War in lowercase letters. You show your ignorance if you do that. The Civil War is an event that stands alone. There's nothing else like it. World War II is a, uh, an event that stands alone. And the Great Depression stands alone, and you capitalize those things. But then, and, and by the way, when was the Great Depression? 30s. 1930s. So, <clears throat> the Panic of 73, I didn't say it was the worst depression. This is the worst depression, but it's the worst depression we have up until the Great Depression. And there was no government help for people. So people are in a bad way uh, all over the country. But at the same time, get this down, gold will be discovered here in the Black Hills. All of this is happening simultaneously. The Native Americans are starting to gravitate toward the Little Bighorn River Valley. There's a depression back in the east. Banks are collapsing. People are hungry, starving, homeless, jobless. And at the same time, right here in the middle of the country, out in the Black Hills, there's a great gold strike. Did the country need gold? Did the country need gold? Yes, because we're in a what? Yes. By the way, get this down. We were on the gold standard in those days. What does that mean? What does the gold standard mean? Our money was what? Gold. gold. You've seen the movies. The cowboys go in the bars. They give me a whiskey and they put a twenty dollar gold piece, of, gold piece on the bar, and the bartender gives them a, I don't know, a ten dollar gold piece, a five dollar gold piece, and three one dollar gold pieces has changed. You've seen that. By the way, was our money valuable when it was gold? Which is more value? You know, if I put here's a twenty dollar bill. God, I scared myself to death. If I put this up here. When I put a $20 gold piece up here, and I said, if you could have any one that you want, you came up here, which one would you pick up? Gold. Why? Because it's more valuable. Gold is more valuable than what? Money. Paper. Paper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why is gold more valuable than paper? Because it's more rare. It's more rare. That's the answer right there. There's not much of it. So when we were on the gold standard, was there a lot of money in circulation? No. No, you didn't see very much money when we were on the gold standard. But during the Great Depression, President Roosevelt took us off the gold standard. And since then, we'd had paper money once in a while. In the Civil War, Lincoln printed money called, I think, 20 million greenbackers. That's what they called them, greenback dollars, to help finance the war. Uh, could you buy as much with 
a twenty dollar green backer dollar as you could with a gold twenty dollar gold piece note. So what did they do after the civil? By the way, what's that called? You know, when your money you have more money, you have a lot more money in circulation, but you can buy less with it. What's that called? Inflation. What? Inflation. Exactly. Very good. That's what we're going through right now. Inflation. So we've got a society today that's awash with money. It's just not worth as much as the gold. But we're satisfied with that. I'm satisfied with it. And I'd rather have some purchasing power than no purchasing power at all. But uh, we were on the we were on the gold standard, uh, and uh, we needed gold. And gold is discovered in the Black Hills. And thousands of Americans who are unemployed want to go out. And by the way, reports come back from the Black Hills that there were newspapers in the East said there was gold from the grassroots on down. You didn't have to just, just dig up, a, just pull up a, plump of, a, 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 a clump of grass and there was gold there. Uh, newspapers said you could walk around and cut for a couple of afternoons and you could uh, pick up, an, just pick, you didn't have to dig for it, you just had to pick up the gold, on, which is a lot, lie, but you had to pick up the gold off the ground and you could go home after a couple of days and live uh, independently wealthy for the rest of your life. And thousands of Americans want to go out there uh, and start mining gold. And the government wants them to do that. Uh, but what's the problem? This is in 1873. What's the problem for the United States government? It's what? What? Reserved for the Sioux Nation. Yeah, what reserved? That's a good word. What reserved the Black Hills for the Sioux Nation? Which tree? Well, Give me a second one. Well, what's the name of the treaty? The Fort Laramie Treaty. Get this down of 1868. Now you got to get some. You got to wake up and you got to get some things in your head. Treaty of Fort Laramie signed in 1868. The Sioux Indians were defeating the army up here, and the army wanted them to stop. So they said, what will it take to stop this war? And they met at Fort Laramie. And the main thing was set aside the Black Hills forever for us. That was in 1868. 1873 is five years later. They're in a depression. And we want that gold. You understand that? Yes. And so what happened? White settlers, get this down, started flooding in to South Dakota. And the Native Americans protested that. They said, this is a direct violation of the treaty, which it was. And what did the government say? Well, there are so many people going in out there, we just can't do anything about it. Sorry. And what was the reaction of the Native Americans to that? Well, we can do something about it. We can kill them. And so they start killing whites. Get this down. And so, in January of 1876, get this down, January of 1876, the government announced <clears throat> that any Native Americans in the West, get this down, any Native Americans in the West who weren't on a reservation, who were not on a reservation, by May of 1876, we're going to give you five months, about as long as your second semester in school, to get to a reservation. And if you're not in a res on, a, on a reservation by May of 1876, we're going to send armies out to destroy you. And some of the Native Americans headed toward reservations. But maybe as many as 10 to 12,000 <coughs> headed up here to the Little Bighorn River Valley. And they created the largest Native American encampment, I think, in the history of of the United States. They were led by a host of war chiefs. A host of war chiefs. Here's some pictures. By the way, it's mainly Sioux and Cheyenne. It's mainly Sioux with some Cheyenne. But uh, here are, look at that guy. Look at the intensity on his face. Every football coach hopes a guy that looks just like that. Look at those eyes. Looks just like that. Shows up to practice. They want somebody that intense. Imagine being some little skinny Irish private up on a hillside in Montana and you fired your rifle three times and the chamber's so hot that that copper shell, that you the, the, the shell casing has swollen up and it won't eject and you've got to pull your pocket knife out 
and try and dig that thing out. And that guy's running up that hill with that hatchet to split your skull. Uh, that has to be pretty darn disconcerting. Low dog, he's one of the leaders of the uh, of the uh, Sioux. Uh, look at that guy. Touch, I like that name. Touch the clouds. Okay, he's another great chief up there. Touch the clouds. Here's another one. Rain in the face. They always said that he's the one to kill Custer. He denied it, but uh, he said he didn't even know Custer was there. I think he was telling the truth. Uh, but rain in the face. Look at that guy. That's Gall. He was seven foot tall. He weighed 280 pounds. Imagine being some little German private up there trying to jam that gun. That guy's running up the cliff with a hatchet to chop your head off. Uh, your last act on this earth would be to pee on yourself. But anyway, there's Gaul, seven foot tall. He would have to duck to come in that door. And if you wouldn't unlock the door, he would kick it down. Anyway, there's Chief Two Moons. And there is one of the best known Native Americans of all. Get this guy down. That's Sitting Bull. It's not his real name. That's what Americans called him, Sitting Bull. His father named him Jumping Badger, okay? His father named him Jumping Badger. I think probably him and Crazy Horse and Geronimo are the best three known Native Americans of all of the Indian Wars. Uh, his father gave him his name, uh, Jumping Badger, um, but he had sort of a nickname that they called him. He was kind of like Crazy Horse. It was Buffalo Sits Down. Uh, and it, and his, what his name was actually uh, was uh, Lananka Iyotaka, uh, and that means Buffalo Sits Down. And later on, when newspapers started writing about him because he becomes very famous, the newspapers just shortened that and called him Sitting Bull, and that's how he comes. It's mistranslated. That's, that's how he comes down to us today. Uh, he... Uh, Counted his first coup. He touched his first enemy in battle when he was 14. That's pretty good. 14. Uh, hold it for 14 year olds in the eighth grade. Yeah, I wonder how many of them we could go down and recruit this afternoon to go into a war. And we're going to say, now the enemy over there has guns. And they're going to be trying to kill you. But what your mission is, is to run over there and touch one of them and run back. I don't think we could probably recruit very many people uh, to do that. He did it when he was 14. By the way, he was a fighter. But he, he got wounded in the foot, and he had a pronounced limp. He had nine wives, okay, and several children. Um, but at, uh, when he's this age, uh, he's no longer a warrior, okay? Get this down. At the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and that's what we're leading up to, the Crazy Horse was the main leader of the Native Americans. What this man did, though, get this down, he was a prophet. He was an Indian prophet. <clears throat> spell it like this. What is a prophet or a seer? Don't spell it like this. This means you mow yards to make a prophet. He's a prophet. What is a prophet? Are there any prophets in the Bible? Can you name me any of them? They're in the Old Testament, the last few books. Paul. No, Paul was, he was a Christian. He was, he was Jewish, but he was a Christian. He's in the New Testament. Jeremiah. Isaiah. Isaiah Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Micah. And on the list goes. Did we say Jeremiah? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, if you read the book of Jeremiah, remove all weapons from the room. It's the most depressing book you've ever read. It starts out bad and it gets worse. Anyway, Jeremiah. That you know, we've we've actually coined a, an English term out of his name, a Jeremiah. When somebody says, "Boy, that was a real," Jew. somebody gives a speech at a graduation and it doesn't have any hope in it, they say, "Boy, that's a real Jeremiah." Jeremiah, we're all doomed. Okay. Well, anyway, he was a prophet. What does a prophet do? A prophet is someone who can see the future. Okay, get that down. That's what they believe Sitting Bull was. He could see the future. 
He told the native, he told his followers this. He told the, those thousands up there at the little bighorn this. He said, you know, the whites may get me at last, but I'm going to have a good time to, till then. You're fools to make yourself slaves to a piece of bacon and a little sugar and a little coffee, end quote. And so uh, he knew, he said he knew the soldiers. He said, they're, they're, they're eventually going to come after us. He said he knew the soldiers were coming after them. Uh, but he said, uh, uh, he told the people, be calm. He said, we're going to win. He said, we're going to win. And uh, to back up his prediction, uh, two weeks before the Battle of the Little Bighorn, the Battle of the Little, Little Bighorn is on June 25th, 1876. On June 6th, 1876, he went out and sat on the side of a mountain uh, and he underwent the, the sun dance. Do you know anything about what the sun dance is? They would erect a pole and they would have leather straps, uh, leather uh, strips of buffalo skin. They would have a large hook and they would hook that in your chest uh, and you would uh, pray and you would dance around that pole uh, until you lost consciousness. And when you lost consciousness, uh, you uh, would uh, have a vision of the future. Well, he, uh, but the whole time you were dancing, you had to keep staring right at the sun. And while you're preparing to get those hooks in your chest to start dancing, you took a little sharp instrument called a uh, sewing awl. You know, I guess I don't know much about it, but if you're knitting or sewing and it knots up on you, there's this little sharp spike you can use to undo the the knot and then continue your project, whatever it is you're making, you'd take that sewing all and you would cut 50 chunks of flesh out of each forearm. You'd bleed a while and then they'd hook those in there and then you'd start dancing around that pole and the whole time you had to keep your eyes on the sun. Sitting Bull danced for 18 straight hours looking up at the sun and finally he collapsed and fainted, he fainted, lost consciousness are you awake? You look like your eyes are closed. Look at me. Well, don't look so look look at me so I can make sure. There you go. Anyway, um, he uh, danced for 18 hours and he had this vision. And he gets up and he goes back to the camp and he calls the people together and he said, "I had a vision." And he said, "I saw dead soldiers falling into our camp like dead." He said, "I saw soldiers falling into our camp like dead grasshoppers." He said, don't worry, we'll kill all of them. All of them that they send after us, we will kill them. Well, meanwhile, while he's going through all that, get this down, there were three armies. He was right. The, the, the soldier, the army was coming after them. And uh, there's where the little bighorn battle happens, not far from where you're sitting. You ought to go up there. I'm going to show you some pictures of it. But anyway, this is the most famous battle of the Indian Wars. Uh, but anyway, there were three armies Go back to this for just a minute. Get it in your head. You're here, and there it is in southeastern Montana. Uh, there were three armies coming after him. Uh, here's the Little Bighorn River Valley. Here were these thousands of Native Americans. Here's General Gibbon. And you don't have to write down all these people. But just pay attention to what I'm saying. There's an army coming out of Fort Ellis under General Gibbon. It's marching, and they're to come in from the north. There's a, another army coming from Fort Abraham Lincoln. It's marching west, and they're to come in from the west. And then there is a column coming up from Fort Fetterman, named after Captain Fetterman, who was massacred down here, uh, coming up from Wyoming under General Crook and General Crook's army. And what they here's the timeline. You do need to write this down. Here's the way it was supposed to work. Here's the way it was supposed to work. On, uh, uh, well, Monday, these three armies were supposed to arrive on Monday, June 24th. No, that's not right. June 26th, 1876. These three armies are supposed to converge on that village on uh, June 26, 1876. Now look at all those names there. 
And the only name that comes to us, there's only one name that comes out of the army side through history. Who is that? Custer. Who? Custer. That's right. Write that down. George Armstrong Custer. And actually, and by the way, here's Custer. That's what he would look like at the time. There's Custer. <clears throat> well, there's Sitting Bull. There's another picture of Custer. He designed his own uniform. He didn't like the uniform the Army gave him. That's actually a sailor suit. The top half of that, that's what sailors wore. And he just took it and put some stars on it, and that's what he wore. Where's the, where's these high regulation Army boots? But there's George Armstrong Custer. And of all the, you know, I think I showed you this picture the other day. Out of all the people in the Indian Wars on the Army side, he's the most famous. That's all. You never heard of Nelson A. Miles. Like I say, you never heard of Alfred H. Terry, Crook, uh, any of these people, uh, except Custer. And Custer fought in two battles. One was the Battle of the Washita. He won that going away. And the second one is the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which we will finish tomorrow, in which he's going to be wiped out. So write this down. We're not done yet. Write this down. Uh, Custer was not supposed to play a very big role in this. We go back to this map real quick. You know, you, you would think that Custer was given orders to go and fight the battle all by himself. Custer was in the command of the cavalry, horse soldiers. All the rest of these people are foot soldiers. They're walking. Horses can go faster than soldiers walking. And so Custer... <laughs> and what was Custer's regiment? Yeah, but what was the number? What was the number of the regiment? Seventh, Seventh. Seventh Cavalry. Here's what they told. Here's what Custer, and this is all he was supposed to do. He wasn't even supposed to participate in this battle. And yet this battle comes down to us in history as Custer's last stand. <laughs> Pardon me. Custer was ordered to take his cavalry and to go ahead of the army and swing down south of that village and go out here west and park his cavalry. That's all he was supposed to do. Because these three armies figured when we converge on that building, building on that village, what are those Native Americans going to do? Run. And what's the only direction they can run? West. And who's going to be sitting out there to literally drive them back into the army so the army can defeat them? Seventh Cavalry. The Seventh Cavalry and Custer. But if things go right, Custer will be miles out here, miles out here, and he won't even participate in the battle. And yet he's the only one that ends up participating on the Army side, participating in the battle. You know what got him in that battle? What do you reckon? What changed the whole plan? Kid. What? Kid. What? The kid? No. No. Well, he does that. It's meat and he doesn't enjoy a bread box. The longer I study history, the more amazed I am how great events are influenced by little simple things. You ever heard the saying, "One of a nail, a shoe was lost, and one of a shoe." A horse was lost for one of a horse. A messenger was lost for one of a messenger. The message was lost. And for one of a message, the battle was lost. What did that all start with? A horseshoe bait. You know what got Custer in this battle? A lost box of bread. I'll tell you how that works. <laughs> I'm going to go to the next one.